A very critical part of the ankle foot examination is assessing the hallux, also known as the great toe. Starting with a callus examination is reasonable. Note the difference in the callus pattern on the foot on the left with heavy wear under the second and third metatarsal head and almost no wear under the IP joint. Whereas the image on the right, you see heavy wear under the IP joint. So that tells you where the load is being borne in the gait cycle. Also make a note of the posture here. The image on the left is in hallux adduction. The image on the right is in hallux abduction. You want to look at this in the open and closed kinetic chain. Here's a callus pattern under the IP joint medially, and there's a much less developed callus under the metatarsal head. For that patient that had the excessive callus under the second metatarsal head, we need to consider that they may have a Morton's toe, where the first metatarsal head is shorter than the second. During gait, it's normal for the center of mass to transfer from lateral heel to medial big toe. If the big toe is too short, that may not occur. The last point of contact may actually be the second toe. Therefore, there may be prolonged weight bearing on the second toe and lead to pathologies in and around the first ray. To examine for this, slightly plantar flex the phalanges and draw a line at the joint lines for the MTP and compare. It's easy to see in this x-ray. Countless patterns of the shoe can also be very helpful. Notice on the right shoe, excessive wear in the metatarsal head. And in this shoe, no wear under the first metatarsal head. This next shoe is classic for someone with a bunion because the hole is right near the first metatarsal phalange joint. Probably have hallux abducto valgus bunion. Let's now look at the MTP joint a little bit more closely. It is a bichondrular synovial joint and does primarily move in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion as well as adduction and abduction, but it also has an important rotary component, which you often see in dysfunctional feet. So we're going to assess all three of these component motions of the MTP joint. So for MTP dorsiflexion in an open chain, so the phalanx concave structure moves on a fixed convex metatarsal. But that's not how it works in real life. The way gait works, the phalanx is fixed on the ground, and the body, along with the metatarsal, moves on a fixed phalanx. It functions more like that. This has implications for manual therapy. And also remember that you're essentially doing a drawer test, just like for an ACL rupture. If the plantar plate is ruptured or turf toe is present, you're going to see excessive movement here of the phalanx. So it's very important to assess this. In this live patient example, we're stabilizing the distal metatarsal, bunching the skin, and gliding the phalanx. Bunching the skin frees up a lot of the soft tissue mobility around this joint. It's an important component of this test, as is taking the phalanx into maximum plantar flexion to see pure available excursion of accessory motion, just like you would in a knee. Bunch, plantar, dorsi. Bunch plantar dorsi. Now as we work our way up into the tarsometatarsal joint on the first ray, notice it's essentially planar. Irregular, but planar. This is the same for the navicular and the medial cuneiform. These irregular shapes may help with stability when the arch is formed. But when you compare these two joints, medial cuneiform and navicular and the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal to the navicular and the talus, you see a big difference. This is essentially a ball and socket joint, which allows for a lot more mobility. And this has implications on the hallux, of course, which we'll cover in subsequent sections how to assess a subtalar and metatarsal joint and put it in the context of the first MTP. Now for measuring first MTP dorsiflexion range of motion, it's important to put the goniometer stabilization arm along the metatarsal shaft, which is depicted right here with my index finger. 
The moving arm should be along the proximal phalanx. It should not be along the distal phalanx, as will be shown momentarily. In this image, you see inappropriate placement of not only the proximal arm of the goniometer, but the distal arm. It's aligned with the distal phalanx, which is allowing for compensation at the IP joint. Remember, this is fundamentally a bicondylar joint, and transverse plane motion into adduction and abduction is important. Here, adduction is depicted, and only a few degrees should be available. You'll sometimes see this occur posturally in first MTP adducted posture. So you want to measure this posturally as well as range of motion. There should be more abduction than a deduction available. And it's a very common deformity to see in hallux abducto valgus or a bunion. And here we're depicting this dynamically. Firm stabilization of the metatarsal shaft as you move into adduction and abduction. Let's move on to the accessory range of motion in the transverse plane. Stabilize the distal metatarsal and glide the phalanx medially and laterally. Some deformities like hallux abducto valgus are going to have restrictions of these glides. Often, in this case, a restriction of lateral glide is going to occur in hallux abducto valgus. Next, let's measure MTP plantar flexion and IP plantar flexion. Some consider this first MTP plantar flexion as a vestigial motion. However, sometimes on unstable surfaces, during sports and other activities, a lack of plantar flexion at the IP or the MTP joint can limit the stability gained by the intrinsic and extrinsic toe flexors, and it is an important motion to check, although in most cases less important than dorsiflexion. Here's MTP plantar flexion. It should have roughly 30 degrees or so. Imagine the foot, in particular the forefoot, is in a supinated position during a sport. A big toe should be able to maintain contact with the ground with forefoot pronation and supination. IP plantar flexion should also be available. This is an important component of foot stability in the first ray and its partner in crime, the phalanges, in its search for the ground and thus foot stability. Next, we're going to check rotation. So invert and evert the phalanx on a fixed metatarsal shaft. Now looking at the IP joint of the hallux, it's very important to get a rough estimate of the ability of that joint to compensate for a loss of MTP joint motion. It's a very robust joint and very rarely develops degenerative changes, which is a silver lining for those patients that have MTP joint arthritis. Okay, so let's take a look at the when last test or the functional hallux limitus and open chain. Some refer to it as a when last screen. It's important to note here that when you dorsiflex the first MTP, the metatarsal head should aggressively plantar flex. Let's take a look at that again in slow motion. Notice the plantar flexion of the metatarsal head relative to the heel. Now let's take a look at a real patient with a very cute pedicure. She's in standing, not in dorsiflexion or plantar flexion. Notice that very little MTP joint dorsiflexion. Even if I use the IP joint, there's very little dorsiflexion available. So she has a positive functional hallux limitus. Let's move on to an important variant of this test. If we dorsiflex the ankle and then the MTP joint, we're going to be engaging a flexor hallucis longest, most likely. Some still refer to this as a variant of the Winlast test or the functional hallux limitus test, which it is, in fact, all of those things. But if we allow dorsiflexion to occur in the proper plane of the ankle joint and a bit of pronation, and we actually include the IP joint as well, we have fully engaged the flexor hallucis longus muscle length, 
and we should integrate that into our intervention plan if it's restricted and necessary for this person's movement demands. Let's look at this in another case example. This patient has normal MTP joint motion. And actually, make a note of how the arch rises and the limb slightly externally rotates. And just a quick reminder to not test just at the IP joint. That would be a false positive. Make sure you lift at the proximal phalanx to fully engage the windlass to fully assess the function of the MTP joint. Now make note also that this person is in plantar flexion and likely doesn't have full weight bearing on this limb. But for purposes of demonstration, this is what a normal should look like. Now you could also test this with the ankle in more neutral and a static standing position or in maximum dorsiflexion, which will be demonstrated now. Even here, she's going to pass this test. And also make note that she did not pronate when she dorsiflexed. That's probably because she knows a thing or two about proper movement. And if we had her pronate, it would be good to see how that would affect her movement. Most likely, it would seriously obstruct her MTP joint motion available. Some people use this as a 30-30 test, 30 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion and 30 degrees of MTP dorsiflexion as a criterion cutoff for return to sport, in particular running, or at times even barefoot running. If considerable force is needed to resupinate the foot, that could be a key indicator to you that this patient may be at risk for injury and may benefit from mobilization techniques, orthotics, strapping, and exercise. In fact, resistance to supination is most likely much more important than what the foot looks like. Does it have a high or low arch, etc.? Now we're going to take a little closer look at the first ray. That would include the entire big toe unit from the phalanges, through the metatarsal shaft, through the cuneiforms, the vicular, and some may even include the talus. But primarily here, what we're going to do is grab the metatarsal and make sure that that first ray can form a transverse arch, essentially wrapping around the second metatarsal. We fixate the second and third metatarsal, and we make sure that that first ray can plantar flex, and evert. So plantar flex, evert, dorsiflexion, invert. Now, as we move over to the fourth and fifth ray, which functions with the cupoid, we're primarily looking here at the other component of this transverse arch. Notice it functions in opposite to the first ray. Plantar flexion, an inversion, dorsiflexion, eversion. And here we're checking for rotation of the first ray axis, plantar flexion, eversion, dorsiflexion, inversion. Now, while we're testing rotation of the first ray, Let's actually check translation as well. This can be done at the distal or the proximal aspect of the metatarsal. Now we're moving to pure accessory motion, no rotational component of the inner metatarsals. Although not shown, continue this examination throughout metatarsal shafts one through five. Next we're che checking the resting position of the first ray. It's important to consider the sesamoids that can give you a false positive for a plantar flexed first ray. So we go just proximal to that. And we compare the shaft of the second to the shaft of the first. And roughly want to determine is it plantar flexed or dorsiflex. In this case, the first ray at rest is neutral to slightly dorsiflexed. You'll see with chronic overpronators that the first metatarsal may be significantly dorsiflexed at rest. It may, over time, have developed a restriction to plantar flexing, which is what we're going to check next, is excursion from neutral. A pes cavus foot type, 
may have a plantar flex first ray. So there's the range from neutral. It can dorsiflex and it can plantar flex. There's some limitations with this motion. In particular, some slight restriction in plantar flexion. This person most likely has mild overpronation. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If so, like it, comment, share it. What we didn't include yet was strength testing of the hallux or the intrinsics or extrinsics of the foot, which we'll do in a separate video. And in reality, this is just scratching the surface with a focus on manual examination for mobility deficits or hypermobility. It's important to put this examination, this hands-on exam, in the context of the movement system. It's important for the clinician to do a detailed gait analysis, movement screening in the context of what that patient needs, whether that's running, squatting, lunging, jumping, etc. When you combine the movement systems analysis with the hands-on examination, the clinician can get closer to an accurate and effective exercise prescription, manual therapy prescription, and potentially even orthotic prescription. Reach out to me if you have any suggestions.